Greetings. This is a presentation about refactoring an already in existence scientific software. The license slide. So we start with the definition of what is refactoring. Yeah, the formal definition that you will find in literature is that it is a disciplined way of restructuring an existing body of code so that you do not change its external behavior, but you change its internal structure. This is a fundamentally different process from that of uh, code development because you already have a working code. And therefore, you know its behavior and you understand what is involved in that code. Another very important thing is that you have the option of creating baselines for every aspect of behavior that you wish to preserve before you start working with the code to refactor because and then you can use these baselines for comparison purposes. Uh, one can do refactoring for many reasons. Sometimes people do it because they had developed a code and they wanted to make sure that it was working and then they want to make it more maintainable or they want to distribute it to other people. And so they want to improve its sustainability and modularity. Maybe they want to make it easier to use and understand. Sometimes you do refactoring because you want to port your code to a new platform. Um, and sometimes, many times actually, what occurs in scientific codes is that you want to be able to extend the capabilities and sometimes in order to extend those capabilities, you need to introduce more structural flexibility into the code. <clears throat> but for any of those reasons, uh, an example workflow of the kind that you that might be useful to think about in terms of refactoring is shown in this view graph. So you start the process. You, before starting the process, presumably you have created tests, uh, such as unit tests and regression tests that, we, that you can run at every stage. So you carry out one iteration of refactoring and then you run the regression or your unit test. If the tests pass, then you're done with this stage of your refactoring. If the tests don't pass, then you go to this particular, the first feedback loop where you go and you fix the code and you keep doing it until your regression and unit tests pass. If once your regression or unit tests have passed, you go on to the next state and you question if is this all that you wanted to do in this um, round of refactoring. If you are done, then we go on to the final stage. But if you're not done, then we go back and we refactor. And then we go, to, go through the same cycle as we did before in that we run a regression or unit test. If it's passed, we move on to the next decision point, if not, we go fix the code and keep keep doing this loop until we are satisfied. Now at this decision point, the second decision point, if our refactoring is done, we are still not completely done because now we want to do is we want to have some integration tests and we want to make sure that they also pass. So we reach this third decision point where if the integration test pass, then we are really done with the refactoring. But if we are not done with the, uh, if the integration tests do not pass, then we are not yet done with the refactoring. And we go back to the point where we fix the code, we go through the loop until the regression and unit tests pass, we go on to do the integration test. And only when all of the tests that were built to make this happen have passed is when we uh, declare success in the refactoring process. So here we go back to the running example that we've had throughout the tutorial. Uh, in that we have this pipe in the wall where we want to determine if the freezing is going to uh, 
make the pipes first. And so basically what we are doing is we are solving for a heat equation given some boundaries and initial conditions. Now, in the repository, you can see that there are two versions of this uh, code. So one of them is a single file with a monolithic code, which is the ugly code, and the other is a modularized, reusable, maintainable code. Uh, for a moment, assume that we only had the first version and we wanted to get to the second version. So we would be, in this situation, we would be doing refactoring to get to the second version. So that would be our objective. And that brings us to thinking about where, what are the considerations uh, before we begin the process of refactoring. So the first one that is that you must ab absolutely be convinced about is, is to know why you are refactoring. Do you really have to refactor? And also know what should your code look like? Where do you want it to be after refactoring? So if we go to the example, our running example of uh, heat equation, uh, and if we only had the monolithic ugly spaghetti code, then the refactoring is necessary because it is a monolithic code. It is not a good coding practice at all. There is no reusability in any part of the code and therefore devising tests for it is extremely hard and you cannot extend the code easily because you don't, it's very hard for someone coming in um, to understand the structure and in any case, extensibility is not being built into the structure of the code. Uh, to answer the second question, as in where do we want to be after refactoring, we want to be closer to the second version, which is more modular, more maintainable, and actually extensible. So to uh, know the scope of refactoring, we have to think about how deep a change are we interested in and how much of code is going to be affected. Pre-planning all of this, and understanding it ahead of starting refactoring are important to keep the costs under control and also to do the refactoring in a timely fashion. Um, to go back to the heat example, in this particular instance, we do not want any capability extension. There is no consideration about performance. We just want a cleaner, more maintainable code. And so in order to convert this monolithic code, the steps that we take is we separate out the utilities, we generalize interfaces. We move the global definitions into a header file that can be included in all um, the source code files that we're going to break out the monolithic code into. We need to generate, create a general build function because the monolithic code can just simply be compiled by issuing a compilation command, but that's really not the way uh, you want to uh, have to build any um, non-trivial code. And in this instance, when we are doing the refactoring, we are not writing any new code and we are not making any intrusive changes to the code. Uh, before we start, we need to know cost estimates. This is, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this step in the process. Um, the second thing that is absolutely critical is that you should have a well-defined plan for verification in place, which means that one should check for coverage provided by existing tests, check where uh, there is a part of the code that you're going to touch, and therefore you want to ensure that it has an unchanged behavior but that no tests exist in order to verify that the behavior remains unchanged. For those instances, it is imperative to develop new tests. So there should be no gap in your te testing and verification strategy to ensure that the code behavior remains unchanged after refactoring. Uh, you should also make sure that the tests exist at different granularities. There should definitely be demanding integration and system level tests. And by demanding, I mean these should be tests that should fail easily if the behavior is not uh, um, as it, uh, it should be expected to be after the refactoring. And these tests should not be very forgiving of uh, 
the changes, which means that for any small perturbation, also these tests should fail if they if the that perturbation is not a part of the acceptable behavior. Before embarking upon the code changes, one should absolutely know the bounds, which means how much behavior change is acceptable. So just now I was talking about uh, behavior change, behavior not changing, and that's part of the definition, but certain behavior change is unavoidable. For example, if you change the order of floating point operations in any code, even in non-trivial ways, you cannot guarantee bitwise reproducibility of the answers. And so ahead of time, you should know how much of that change is acceptable. And there may be other similar things in terms of behavior change, but you should know ahead of time what is acceptable and plan for it. And for those reasons also, you should know error bounds. And in your mind and for the entire team, uh, you should have a map from here to there in the sense of where you're starting out in your code from and where you want to get to at the end of refactoring process. As you are doing the planning, you should also make sure that the testing overheads are incorporated into the refactoring costs. Uh, not planning for those can actually uh, make the cost spiral out of control very easily. So now we go to the exercise of refactoring the running example. Uh, I'm leaving the bigger refactoring to you as an exercise. So in that exercise, you convert heatall.c to the cleaner version with the usable code. Uh, it doesn't have to resemble the code that is already sitting in the directory. In fact, I do. I prefer that you do not look at that code before you embark upon the refactoring process. Um, and you come up with your own strategy. So think about what you want your final product to be and only then go through the exercise of refactoring. However, as a part of this presentation, I'm going to walk through another example of refactoring with much more limited scope. And so here, as an example exercise, what I'm doing is I am taking the clean solution. Uh, in the clean solution, you will notice that uh, each method of integration has its own uh, in implementation and its own interface. And all of those are compiled into the binary so that you can select at runtime as a part of argument list as to which of the particular solution uh, integration methodology you wish to use. Now, what I want to change in the code is I do not want to have to include all of these uh, as, a, uh, as object files. What I want to be able to do is I want to generalize the update solution interface. And the reason why I want to do it is, is that uh, if I want to add any new method of integration, I have to not only write a new routine, I also have to make changes to the code that invokes the update solution. And so I don't want to have to change heat.c for adding another method, which is what I have to do in the code now. Uh, so I'm not going to take cover all of the methods exhaustively. I'm going to, we are going to do uh, two integration methods, FTCS and upwind15 as alternative options in this particular exercise. So here we prepare for refactoring the heat, uh, the cleaner version of the heat equation solver. Uh, so we run with FTCS so that the results are stored under a subdirectory called FTCS results. We have updated, if you notice in the make file, we have updated it with a coverage flag turned on so that we will actually get uh, a summary of what, which parts of the code were exercised. Um, so then we um, build and run the code and then we examine heat C. As the testing module told you, uh, the where there are a sequence of hashes, what that tells you is that that particular solution was not, uh, that particular line was not exercised in this instance of execution. So we can see that update solution FTCS was 
uh, invoked 500 times, but that update solution upwind 15, the other method that we are interested in uh, examining was not exercised, and this is something that we need to fix. So what we do is we run the executable again, this time picking the algorithm to be upwind 15 and run time to be up, upwind results so that the result, these results are um, stored in another subdirectory called upwind results. And now if you will look at the code coverage uh, statistics, you will see that update solution FTCS is not exercised, but update solution upwind 15 is indeed exercised. So now between what we did in the first instance of execution and the second instance of execution, we have coverage for both FTCS and upwind 15, and we have the baselines um, that are already pre present in the subdirectory, right? So now we have uh, covered our bases and now we are ready to actually do the refactoring. So uh, this is what the starting code looks like where we have uh, interfaces for update solution FTCS, interface for up update solution upwind 15, and then interface for update solution crank Nicholson. You will notice that even though the interfaces for the first two are identical, the interface for the third looks different. Uh, Crank Nicholson has an extra argument. And if you look at the source code, you will find that it also has an extra step in initialization. And so even though we are verifying it only with FTCS and upwind 15, if we want to generalize uh, the update solution as an interface, we also have to account for the extra arguments and extra step in initialization that are there in Crank Nicholson. So what we do is we generalize the interface where we have added that extra uh, argument that accounts for um, Crank Nicholson. And you'll notice that now this interface is called update solution with no qualifier at the end of it. We also modify the make file where now we have different sequence of uh, files, a different collection of files for generating a different uh, binary. So we have source one, which includes FTCS.C. We have source two, which includes upwind15.C and source three, which includes crankc.c. Uh, crank and we have three different executables that can be built. In addition to this, we add a null implementation of initialize underscore crank in FTCS and upwind 15. So now what we do is we, uh, are at this point in time, we think that we are done with the refactoring of the code. And we want to verify that our building, uh, our refactoring of the code has not broken it in any way. So we uh, build the code, build the binary heat one, and run with the FTCS results, make the binary heat two, um, run it with upwind results, and verify against baselines. If the verifications come out true, then we have done the refactoring uh, successfully. So the important thing to note here is what was the objective of this refactoring and what have we traded off? The objective of this refactoring process was to uh, make sure that we have a generic update solution interface in such a way that if we wanted to add another integration method, we did not need to change heat.c. Uh, the trade-off that we have accepted in order to do this is that now we have to select which particular integration method we are running at compilation time instead of at runtime. Um, so those are the changes, and that was the scope of our change. And once we have done all of this verification, we will have met our objectives in this refactoring. So this was a bit of a toy example. Now we move on to a real world example. So the real world example comes from the code that I have long been associated with. It used to be uh, Flash, and now we are 
basically designing it, designing its infrastructure uh, from bottom up in order to generate a new code which is suitable for the uh, heterogeneity that has been increasing in our platforms. But in this instance, uh, I'm not going to talk about the entire change that is going on in the code. I'm going to focus on only one narrow aspect of code refactoring. That was the first step we done in this transition in going from Flash to Flash X. Here, the um, transition was to start supporting a different AMR library. AMR is Adaptive Mesh Refinement. Uh, this concept was introduced earlier in the testing module. Adaptive mesh refinement is a way of changing the resolution in the domain where the resolution is higher, where there's more going on in your uh, um, domain in, in terms of physics. Um, AMR is in effect, of, uh, in effect a compression technique for both the data of footprint and the compute footprint of your code, but it comes with the overheads of uh, bookkeeping that gets a a lot more complicated uh, in order to maintain the consistency of the solution. Traditionally, FlashX has had AMR supported by Paramesh, but that is not really, uh, has been under support, active support for a while, whereas uh, AMRX is a library that is being prepared for Exascale, and so we wanted to be able to interface FlashX with AMRX. Uh, and that's all we are doing. So our change here is limited to the red block that you see under AMR. And, and in, in addition to supporting Paramesh, we just wanted to be able to support AMRX as well and be able to switch between these two implementations of AMR uh, at the time of configuration of the code. So the plan is, to, how do we want to get from here to there, which means that we had to think about how we were going to on-ramp, which means be able to make the changes incrementally and all along the process of make, making these changes incrementally that we are able to convince ourselves that we haven't broken the code in any way, make a design for the process of change, figure out the intermediate steps, and finally to realize the final goal. So our considerations included cost estimation in terms not only of expected developer time, but also the extent to which there would be disruption in production schedules. And for this, we wanted to get a buy-in from the stakeholder, which is generally um, a, a very important thing to do in any non-trivial refactoring of the code. And that includes the users and they, they have to have their buy-in not in terms of the development time, but also in terms of disruption that they may encounter to their, own, to, to their disruption schedules. Uh, in Flash, our initial estimate was that we would take six to 12 months. It actually took closer to 12 months. So this is a, an overall schematic of the process we went through. Don't get intimidated by what it is looking like right now because I'm going to deconstruct this process and walk you through every step of it as we took in going from Flash version 4.4 to uh, um, a, flash, a new Flash version with a new grid unit implementation that supported both AMRX and um, Paramesh. So the first part of it was mapping from here to there on ramp plan. And we, you always have to be, uh, cautious to make plans proportionate to the scope. So the first, the, the top transition shows you two uh, scattered bits of code that you want to ref refactor. And these are independent changes and you can do them all at once, that may be okay. But the kind of change that we were talking about where um, invasive large scale changes in code were needed then doing it all at once is a really bad idea. And so we thought we there were two ways uh, in which we could uh, do our map from here to there. The first plan could have been to turn off all the modules except for the one being refactored and have a way of testing these in intermediate stages. So we would, for example, um, Start with the first module, 
convert it, start with the second module, convert it, start with the third module, convert it. And while we are converting them, verify that each module works on, works perfectly fine after it has been converted. And then we, one by one, we turn on more than one refactored module. And in our arsenal of tests, we should have tests that then verify for uh, interoperability of these modules and confirm that the modules are uh, actually work together even when uh, more than one refactor module is turned on. So this is one on-ramp plan. There is an alternative way of doing it. This is the on-ramp plan two. Uh, and this, in this part, what we do is we first build a separate environment for testing the refactored module. We the module we move it into this isolated environment and we uh, change the module, refactor the module and bring it back into the original environment for testing. And we can do this for any other module that needs to be uh, refactored in the same way that we isolated, bring it into uh, the isolated environment, convert it, put it back into the original environment and when we are done with all of the modules then we are effectively done with our refactoring process in transitioning flash or in doing this uh, transformation for flash we used both of these on-ramp plans so in flash x refactoring we used a mix of strategies so we started with Flash version 4.4 with the support for Paramesh. And we looked at MRX Mesh. We did um, the requirements gathering for both of them in terms of what are the expectations of MRX Mesh interface in terms of how it interfaces with an application. And similarly, we did a quick um, examination of what would be required in a grid unit implementation or a wrapper layer sitting on top of AMRX that would be uh, compatible with Flash's view of its architecture. So the first thing that we did was we created a simpler environment for refactoring and testing. So the, the main uh, solver in Flash that is used for pretty much exercising any part of infrastructure is uh, the shock hydrodynamics. And it is a fairly complex solver. And it is sensitive to perturbations. And uh, it is by no means uh, a simple environment in which to test. So the first thing that we did was we implemented a much simpler version of hydrodynamics that did not exercise um, all of the uh, AMR functionality. For example, we didn't do things like flux correction that are needed uh, for uh, making sure that the solution is absolutely accurate. But we first implemented the simple hydro within Flash 4.4 and created our baselines uh, in Flash for 4.4 with this simple hydro, which means that even if our solutions were not physically accurate, they were generated within a framework that we knew to be working. And, uh, and so what we wanted to do was after interfacing with AMRX, we wanted to be able to match those results uh, with simple hydro so that we'd have confidence in our infrastructure development. So here, what we had to examine was uh, the data structures and iterators. Uh, so the next step in our refactoring process then was to build iterators over Paramesh. And why was this necessary? Because MRX only interacted with, uh, MRX only provided um, iterators. Um, so there is a fundamental difference between Paramesh and AMRX in that Paramesh is an octree based code, which means that there is a well-defined parent-child relationship between uh, 
the blocks that are generated as a part of adaptive meshing, this does not exist in AMRx. And so what AMRx interface that we were building for Flash was required to do was to mimic the behavior of um, AMR that existed within Paramesh, which means that it had to behave as though it was an oak tree, even though it wasn't. And the cleanest way in which uh, AMRx could be presented to um, Flash's physics was to uh, hide the detail of its uh, actual implementation from Flash's physics. And therefore, we wanted to hide all of those details under the iterators. But Paramesh uh, in Flash version 4.4 did not interact with physics through iterators. So in the next stage, what we did was we built iterators over Paramesh, which is part of a mix uh, of our on-ramp plan of uh, changing the iterators within. So this resembles the first on-ramp plan that I talked about where we changed the behavior of one isolated, one component within the framework and test it within the framework, but as an isolated component. So these iterators were built over Paramesh in order to, so that the grid started to now resemble the behavior expected by Paramesh. The next stage was we created a new alternative implementation of the MRX's mesh. So here we completely refactored the grid interface and made it compatible with MRX. Um, this is still operating in the uh, mode where we have a separated out um, simpler environment where we are exercising all of the various uh, grid capabilities and the new grid interface. And we're making sure that now uh, all of the complexity is focused in the, in, in the grid implementation and not in the hydrodynamics implement, implementation. So we tested for the uh, the general ability to fetch the data, apply a physics operator onto it, set, uh, get the state variable back to AMR so that it could regrid, and then it could give the the, the same through the same iterators, it could make the regridded um, mesh also available uh, to the physics operators, and so on and so on. The next step we took was to uh, now use in Paramesh. Now we, what we want to do is now we want to exercise the actual environment with just the new iterators. So we take the iterators, we bring uh, those iterators onto Paramesh, and now we exercise them with our real implementation, the full comfort the full complexity of the implementation of uh, our hydrodynamics. So we take our basic hydrodynamic solver, which is unsplit hydro. It has full features in the sense that it uh, also does things like uh, flux correction and other such AMR related behavior that is necessary. So we update hydro drivers so that they interact with, uh, uh, update the hydro drivers of the unsplit hydro so that they interact with uh, the mesh using the new iterator instead of the old grid API that they had working. And so that is the uh, top level interaction. We first test it by turning off some features related to AMR, which means that we make the AMR behave like a uniform grid and test the iterators with the unsplit hydro then one by one, we turn on various features of AMR. So first we turn on um, regridding, verify that the iterators work. We are still working with the uh, Paramesh. We are not working with MRX yet. So we, we turn on the um, regridding. We make sure that the hydro, unsplit hydro continues to work. And then we turn on uh, the uh, flux correction as well and verify that um, the unsplit hydro hydrodynamics works fine. Uh, mind you, before we turned on unsplit hydro, we had to uh, again make sure that we had the baselines created 
in the earlier implementation of the grid unit, that is without the iterators, uh, with these various features of AMR turned off and turned on one by one. So we had to have these AMRs, um, these uh, features to uh, ensure that uh, we would have the baselines to compare against as we turn on each of these features. In the next stage, uh, we start to exercise these features with AMRX Mesh. So here we did one more very convoluted uh, change where we wanted to control how much was uh, the change we were introducing into AMRX at one given time. So what we did was we uh, created, we turned on both Paramesh and AMRX at the same time. We generated the mesh, the AMR mesh using Paramesh. We wrote a function that would map the Paramesh data structures onto the AMRX data structures so that AMRX mesh was made to believe that it had generated the mesh where actually the mesh was generated by Paramesh and the metadata was encoded uh, to make AMRX feel like it had generated that uh, metadata. And then we let AMRX run uh, its iterators. So the only thing that is now sitting over that is where the AMRX is being exercised is in terms of the grid implementation sitting over AMRX, which is exercising the iterators sitting over AMRX that are getting exercised by the physics operators in uh, Flash. So, and this is where then we, again, one by one, we turn off various features and we verify that they, they work. And then we turn on all needed AMR features uh, as, as they are needed in the final stage. And we let all of the, uh, control go over to MRX. And in the final stage then, uh, we uh, another step now happens is that we have a new grid implementation that is, that is able to switch between MRX and Unsplit Hydro. And a lot of this stuff is still coming from old flash. A lot of the physics operators are still coming from old flash, flash, which will be one by one converted to being able to work with the iterators. And this is, this is the kind of structure that every one of the physics operators will uh, follow. A few other things that are not shown explicitly here that we had to do in addition to uh, the, the things that have been uh, outlined explicitly is that we had to make sure that we could we had modified our IO unit uh, and our comparison utility. So this was very important. We also had to modify our comparison utilities so that they could read a file um, outputted by uh, MRX as well as a file outputted by uh, Paramesh. And this comparison utility is what we were using to make sure that as we were switching step-by-step step from Paramesh to AMRX that uh, our, uh, uh, that we could ensure that the data uh, was being computed correctly and our tests were all working out correctly. So this was all, this was a very focused attempt to go, uh, so to summarize this, um, this particular refactoring process, we were not changing the entire code. We were not changing the entire architecture of the code at this point. The only thing that we were changing was the wrapper layer that sits in the grid unit, which basically hides the details of the AMR library from the physics. And in order to make that happen, we needed to change the way in which physics interacted with the grid unit, instead of directly accessing the state data from the grid unit, the uh, implementation of the grid unit had to be changed so that the state data would be given to the physics operators through iterators uh, so that the physics operators would not be able to differentiate between 
the data coming to them from Paramesh and AMRX. And all of this elaborate procedure that we had to put together was done just to be able to do, to switch this grid iterator. So we, there's very little, it's only the wrapper layers, only the API layers that have been changed in this entire refactoring process. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. And as I mentioned before, for this, we had originally estimated the amount of time um, that it would take us because we thought we had a very modular code to be about six months, but it actually took closer to 12 months before we were able to do this. So with that, we come to the final summarization in terms of what are the takeaways from this particular uh, tutorial module. It is that in order to have a good outcome from refactoring, it is very important to know why. Uh, important to know how much refactoring, how deep and how invasive do you want the uh, code changes to be ahead of time. Because if you haven't planned this carefully, it is very easy to go down the rabbit hole of too many changes and not be able to meet your, meet, meet your objectives. Uh, make a good faith estimation of the cost that it is going to uh, take to do this change and then add at least another 50% more to whatever is your conservative cost because in all likelihood, that is what is going to happen. Have an on-ramp plan uh, from beginning till end. That doesn't mean that you may, you may not need to change it as you start to do the refactoring, but if you start without a plan, you will definitely not uh, be able to keep um, the process on track have an extremely strong testing and verification regime in place before you make the first code change in your refactoring process. Make sure that you have baselines for all of the intermediate stages and all of the uh, changes that you want to uh, make happen in the code. And finally, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to get a buy-in from stakeholders so that you can do these changes in a rigorous way without undue stress and undue coercion from uh, people who are using the code. Because remember, if a code is in existence, chances are very good that that code is being used to do science and people um, and other people's career depend upon the code being available to do to them to do science and therefore uh, in your planning process, you have to work out how and when you're going to make changes so that there is minimum amount of disruption to the stakeholders. And that is the end of this module.